This is Professor Michael Chapman. I'm one of the most experienced IVF doctors in Australia. I believe that an important part that I can contribute is to educate patients in relation to fertility, infertility, and all that that involves. These series of podcasts help to educate you. I hope they are helpful to you. If you wish to know more, however, I'm more than happy to have you contact me via email, which is profmchapman at gmail.com, or make an appointment to see me on 91384222. And I've certainly seen women coming back saying, I, that was, it was great, you got me pregnant, but I don't want to have any more babies, so we'll go through the procedure again and uh, be sterilised again. That, the tubal surgery, really, that's what it's limited to in the 21st century because IVF is so successful in bypassing those problems. If we look at all the women that go through IVF these days, probably only 15 to 20 percent are having it for that original reason of damaged tubes. The vast majority, vast, I won't say vast, but the majority of cases are very mild or unexplained infertility. Well, you've tried for 12 or 18 months and you haven't got pregnant. Uh, we try simple things first with ovulation simulation, intrauterine insemination, and then we move on to IVF. So a great bulk of our patients will fall into that category rather than the tubal disease issue. So tubal disease is still here. There have been concerns over the years that the last decade or so that chlamydia infections are increasing. AIDS, to some extent, helped in reducing that because we all got very scared and used, used condoms. Condom use is apparently declining and we're, we're getting back into having pelvic inflammatory disease again. So tubal disease is still a problem, but not the main reason these days for doing IVF. What is your opinion around laws allowing younger people to find their sperm donors? <laughs> yeah, I'm of, I suppose I'm of the old school that is now being converted. And I've, not because I think it's the right thing, but I think it's the essential thing for people to track down their genetic background. And with the detailed genetic testing we can do, there are many children in the world who are going to discover that their father wasn't their father they thought it was. Donor children really are no exception to that. The issue is why, why is it so essential for somebody to know their genetic background? We're told that it's very important, certainly in the adoption area where children from newborn on being adopted out, the trend has very much been that the child wants to meet their parents and find out why they gave them up. And I think, and that logic has been extended by um, psychologists in particular to the children of donor conceived children. And they have convinced governments to legislate such that we, and for instance, in New South Wales, and I think in four states in Australia, uh, if you're a donor and you produce a child, the, the clinic has to report that child uh, or that donor to the government and the government and, and then they keep a registry that a child at the age of 18 can see whether they were on that register. So going back, however, that legislation really only came into being and that formalisation of the need to tell only came in about 10, 15 years ago. Prior to that, so a large part of my infertility career, donor insemination was an anonymous event that I certainly, as a young doctor in the university in London, would recruit medical students on a regular basis to come and produce a sample. They'd get 10 quid, uh, and but to be told that they, they would be anonymous, that it would be used and they would create a child for a couple who were unable to have children. They were doing something very altruistic and they had no expectation that they would have any involvement with that child in the future. Uh, however, those anonymous donors are now in some places around the world, and certainly I think it's in Victoria, clinics are being told now they have to reveal those anonymous don donors. I think that, I personally think that's going against the rights of the contract they originally undertook to to give the sperm in an altruistic way but that's that's the way it is 
And don't forget that you can access all the previous episodes by going to our website www.theivfjourney.com and select IVF Journey Podcast from the navigation menu.